So my name is Greg Orton. I am the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. Uh, as Christine mentioned, we're a coalition of 34 national API organizations that are working together to represent all of our diverse communities. So this means East Asians and South Asians, Southeast Asians, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And that's important to us because we want to make sure that as we demand inclusivity at a national level, we ourselves are embracing that challenge. Now, all morning we've been talking about civic engagement at the local level, and today's now, or the panel now is talk, or elevated a little bit more to the national level and talk about what's actually at stake from a policy perspective. Now, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of an analogy. I think everyone can agree that voting is the great equalizer, and as former Hill staff, I can tell you that nothing terrifies staff or members of Congress more, but also excites them when you have well-informed, active constituents. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there's one individual in the room who we, we should recognize who understands this probably better than anyone. I'd like to take a moment to recognize former Congressman David Ruth Morgan. Yeah. Now, civic engagement and showing up at the polls is just part of building our power as a community. Now, some people call it an inside-out strategy, grass tops to grassroots, and some of you yesterday heard me say you got to do the work in the streets and in the suites. We show up in the streets voting, making our voices heard, but there's an inside game to be played when it comes to long-term policy change. And so it's a pleasure to introduce our panelists, who are all leaders in their own right of their own organizations at the national level, who are doing that work of long-term policy change. And so I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll introduce them very quickly. We have from SALT, uh, Suman uh, Raganathan. We have Alvin Rowe from uh, Apollo, Kuhil Lewis from CNHA, Quinn Din from CRAC, John Yang from AJC, and Ed Tepper from the uh, Health Forum. Um, I will ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and their organizations a little bit more, but also, also grounded in, from their organizational perspective, what is at stake with this upcoming election, and what are their organizations doing to sort of address those concerns? So, Sumat? Hi. Thanks, Greg. And thanks also for your leadership to build um, a truly diverse spectrum um, of organizations that represent um, the API community. Can folks hear me? Yep. You can usually, I can project more. <laughs> That's my one, though. Um, so, uh, as as Greg mentioned, SALT is a national organization. Uh, we re represent the totality of an incredibly diverse and vibrant South Asian American community nationwide uh, that is the second most growing, rapidly growing demographic group. Um, check in with Karthik Ramakrishnan for even more data on how we're growing rapidly. Um, SALT as a national organization um, is an organization that is a racial justice one uh, and that fights for the civil rights of all South Asian Americans in the US, our ultimate vision as dignity and full inclusion for all. So we're fighting for all of our communities and not just our API communities, but really for communities of color um, and immigrant communities as a whole in this country. Uh, we work really closely with and our policy agenda at the national level as, as well as at the state and local level is informed by what we hear from our community partners on the ground, which includes 62 community-based organizations across the country that serve, work with, organize, or um, actively represent South Asian American communities on the ground from Alabama to California and or the other of the labor uh, or skill spectrum. And finally, a piece around the very place of our communities in the U.S. I'll just end really quickly um, by grouping kind of what's at stake for us, um, not just in the midterms, but also after the midterms, right? What's our accountability strategy for our communities based upon who ends up getting elected and who's not? Those to me fall into three big categories. Uh, threats um, and fundamental questions about our place in this nation, fundamental questions about our nation's core values, and finally, fundamental questions about our very safety. And I'll go through those really briefly, don't worry, I talk fast, um, in reverse order, right? So the pieces about our very safety, can we believe that in this country right now, we are confronting a very close relationship between a White House and an administration that's operationalizing a white supremacist agenda in this country that is in turn translating to waves of hate violence that are surpassing now what we saw immediately post 9-11. Um, we also have, um, you know, threats to our nation's core values. We have uh, an increasing push to uh, to um, create a separate 
um, status of citizenship, right? We have Operation Janice that is revoking, revoking the citizenship of many individuals, overwhelmingly of South Asian descent. And we have threats via public charge and so many other pieces that I know folks from API Health Forum will <coughs> seek to separate our communities based upon who is a naturalized citizen and who is a native born citizen. That is a threat to our four core values of being equal citizens. Um, finally, the pieces around freedom of religion. We all know that the Muslim ban has affected all of our communities disproportionately. And I'll tell you that we're preparing for the next wave of countries to be included in the next wave of Muslim bans, right? And they're probably going to include Pakistan, Bangladesh, and several other countries of the Middle East. And so this question of freedom of religion and equality before the law is in indeed brought into question fundamentally. Really quickly, the pieces around anti-immigrant sentiment increasingly, increasingly being melded with a nativist and, and white supremacist and anti-Muslim agenda are continuing to become ever concerning, right? And that sort of um, moves into the questions about who we actually allow into the country before they even arrive, and finally, how they're treated once they arrive here. And so those pieces are fundamentally questions that would not have allowed me, literally, to be here in front of you all, and for many of us in this room as well. And so I think, you know, when we think about broad, what's at stake for our communities, this is a powerful solidarity movement and moment for so many AAPI communities in particular to resist being pitted against other immigrant communities and other communities of color in a disingenuous wedge politics strategy that is being operated so beautifully by this current administration as well as by the current occupant of the White House. Um, and so this is, you know, kind of what I like to call uh, an opportunity for a movement moment, but also for some really courageous conversations within our own families to make sure that we do not rest on the laurels that we know are so tenuous for so many of our communities. Thank you, Suan. So my name is Alvina Ye, I'm the Executive Director of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. And before I talk more about Paul and my work, I feel like it's important to talk about who I am and who I come from and the community that I bring with me. My parents both came to the US as refugees from the Vietnam War. And when my parents came here, they had nothing. And we were only able to have a thriving middle class life because my mom was able to get a union job sorting mail. So I know there are a couple Coloradans in this room. My mom has probably is still sorting your mail. Um, but I say this because I know that each and every one of us, when we walk into a room, we don't just come with ourselves. We come with all the communities that we represent. And that's a core value of mine. It's a core value of Apollo's. And what we do as an organization is we work to uplift and build power for all working people, all AAPIs. Um, we do this through our 22 chapters that we have across the country, and we do this through building power through all our members to execute our campaigns around economic justice. So we do a lot around uh, corporate accountability, both with work uh, with employers here domestically and globally, because we know an employer that is a bad employer here is the same employer that is a bad employer across the seas, and that still affects you know our Asian Pacific Islander brethren um, overseas. We also have a strong focus on racial and immigrant justice, because um, we know that racial justice cannot be achieved without economic justice. Those two things are hand in hand, and that's a core part of the work that we do. And we have to protect workers as whole people, and not just as workers when they have issues on the work site. Another core piece of our work is around civic and uh, political leadership. So knowing that if we want to change the landscape for AAPIs, if we want to build power for workers, we need to be able to build political power for our communities. And so from the beginning of time, Apollo has always run a very robust civic engagement program to make sure that our chapters are really engaged in year-round organizing with within the democratic system at all levels to make sure that we're holding folks accountable and we're getting the right kinds of people elected. Um, and lastly is around organizing and leadership development, making sure that we are organizing the best and the brightest in our country and that we are giving them the tools and the resources in order to be able to engage on all of those levels. <laughs> So what's at stake for us? And I think it's just basic dignity as workers. Every single person here can say they are a worker, and yet we don't think about on a daily basis how workers' rights have pretty much always been under attack. This is not a new thing. The second that we wanted to claim fair wages or you know safe workplace conditions, employers have always found ways around that, right? And so this is not something new, but it is something that is increasing and is a lot more organized and a lot more emboldened 
by um, those that are currently in power. And so I think for us, changing the landscape, building power is all about protecting those basic rights. And it's not just, again, workplace issues, you know, things like fair wages, but it's also the ability to have access to health care, to protect your family, to have access to affordable housing and education, uh, ability to retire with dignity, um, and the ability to bargain on the job if for some reason you need to be able to push back and hold your employers accountable. Um, the other thing that is really at stake is a strong labor movement. And I know for many people they may say, well, I'm not in a union or, you know, well, how is that relevant to me? But the fact of the matter is we actually have double the number of folks that are in unions than there are uh, API business owners. And we hear a lot about small business owners in the API community, but actually double our population are actually in unions and we should be talking about that, right? This is an issue that affects a lot more folks than folks realize. And not only that, even if you're not in union, if you don't know anyone in union, we know that building a strong labor movement is key to building a strong middle class. And so if a worker's organization runs a campaign, that lifts the boat for everybody else involved. Um, one example I'll bring up is the SEIU Fight for 15 campaign. When that was first launched, a lot of people were like, well, that's ridiculous, $15 an hour? But over time, we've been able to win public opinion on this case. And now people really understand what living wage means and what it means for all workers to be able to live and work with dignity and be able to provide for their families. Um, and, and that's benefited everyone, regardless of whether or not you're in a union. Uh, I, we can talk more about the judicial fight, but there's a lot at stake with the SCOTUS hearings that are that are going on this week. Not just for workers, but for women, for immigrants. You know, the the, the list goes on, and, and that's why we feel like this fight is important, and why we'll continue to be a part of it. Uh, aloha, everybody. Uh, I'm Kuhio Lewis. I'm from Hawaii. I'm with the Council for Native Point Advancement. I'm one of the few PI uh, or, or organizations focused on PI, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, by way of background, um, you know, similar to Alvina here, uh, my, my uh, parents. When I was I was adopted and raised by my grandparents because my parents were both drug addicts, um, and you know. If, like many PIs in the, in the states, opportunities to grow through education, through um, having a financial, uh, having a rewarding financial freedom is very limited. Um, but I overcame many challenges in life, and uh, interestingly, I'm here today sitting on the stage, um, but it wasn't without adversity. But through those experiences, I've had a first-hand look at what needs to be overcome. And so it's with that background, it's with that appreciation, um, I am looking forward to serving. I've only been in this seat for two months. The, I'm the chief executive officer. Uh, some of you may know Michelle Kawane, who's, who I succeeded. Uh, CNHA is a, we have 160 due paying members. So we're a state convener, but we're also a national convener because some of our members come from the continent. We're the largest uh, member-based organization focused on PI issues back in Hawaii. So um, we work closely with our national partners uh, to advance our policy. So in CNHA, we have a number of different pillars. One is civic engagement, another is public policy, advocacy. Um, and some statistics about Hawaii, 40% of our population is Asian Americans. And if you add Native Hawaiians to that and the, and the uh, other Pacific Islanders, we're well over half of the population. So we have a significant stake in the politics of Hawaii. Um, I can say that Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, have a decent voice at our state legislature. Uh, also, even at the national le level, you know, Maisie Hirono is our, is our senator from Hawaii, and, you know, we had Senator Danny Noy, Daniel Inouye Daniel Inouye prior to that. So uh, we have had strong representation that represents our voices from Hawaii. Um, 
and we work closely with them uh, to advance our national policies. And, and I just want to point out what's at stake. I think for in many respects, Hawaii is isolated from what's going on at the national level, but it doesn't mean it doesn't impact us. Uh, there ha we have already, we've seen a setback in a number of priorities that we have spent years advocating for. An example of that is um, Native Hawaiians are the only indigenous people in, the, in America uh, that aren't federally recognized or don't, haven't had a process to be federally recognized like other indigenous people. One of the last acts President Obama did before he left office was he created a pathway uh, for Native Hawaiians to obtain federal recognition. And it was with the support of these national partners that we were able to achieve that. But as soon as he left office, Trump comes in and he has said publicly that he wouldn't support it. So we are at a crossroads right now where we have spent generations advocating for such a process, which is being stonewalled by the current administration. So uh, that's what's at stake for us, is this national voice. I want to thank the Coulter Foundation because what it has done as a state convener, as Coulter's state convener, it has allowed us to open our doors and minds to working closer with the Asian American community. Oftentimes we work in silos, we don't talk to one another. And so this partnership has really allowed us or forced us to open our doors and our horizons to looking at how do we work with these populations. And so I'm looking forward to to that opportunity. I think together we are stronger um, and um, look forward to the conversation uh, going forward. But aloha everybody. Hi everyone, my name is Quinn Din. I'm the Executive Director of CREC and it is such an honor to share this space with you all today uh, amongst a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues, and a lot of leaders who inspire me every single day in this work. So the framing question was, what's at stake for the upcoming 2018 elections? And for me, this is a moment about defining who we are as America as being just, of being humane, and of moving forward a civil rights movement against all odds. That's what 2018 is for me. And it's that America of justice that created CRAC because it was in 1979 that a group of American humanitarians actually started the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center to respond to the biggest refugee crisis that the world had ever seen coming out of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And it's their leadership that led to the passage of the 1980 Refugee Act, which has resulted in over 1.3 million refugees, like Alvina's parents, like my parents, who fled as boat people from Vietnam, not knowing if they would live or die so that today I could be free. And that would have never been possible had it not been for the opening of America's doors with the Civil Rights Movement. Our communities today number over close to 3 million, and we're represented from every coast, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, and even the South. And as a national civil rights organization, our mission is to empower Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese communities to create a socially just and equitable community through three major strategies. One, we build leaders. Today, uh, next year, we celebrate our 20th year anniversary of our leadership and advocacy training program. It's a three-day training program. We have some alumni here in the room. I was an alumni, too. We've graduated close to 1,200 leaders from over 40 states. We build and engage and mobilize community by really informing our communities on the issues that matter most. And finally, we advocate for policy change here at the national level. And we see our community self-determination in really fighting for three core rights. One, our right to family, by having immigration policies that unite us rather than separate us. We fight for our right to heal against historical trauma of displacement, of, dis of war, and of poverty. And we're fighting for our right to be seen, especially for our young people to be seen and visible in our education systems and to be served. And for the past two years, we have seen our communities being attacked on every single one of these fronts. On the immigration front, this year is the 20th year anniversary that we've actually been able to record the number of Southeast Asians who are actually deported 
to Cambodia, Laos, or Vietnam because of past criminal conviction records that happened when they were young people. And the only reason why they're being deported is because they don't have US citizenship. This year, we are seeing that over 16,000 of our community members have deportation orders. And we are seeing a record high from the Cambodian community with an estimate of 200 who are estimated to be deported compared to an average of 40 members per year. So we know that these issues are only getting worse. On the health front, we're so blessed that Health Forum is a huge partner of ours, but we're extremely concerned that our communities continue to face huge rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. Over 60% of the Cambodian community experience PTSD compared to 3% of the US public. And this is a time when our rights to health continue to be attacked under uh, ACA reversal and underfunding of our public health programs. And finally, in education, Karthik can go on and on for days about our fight to be visible through data disaggregation. And that image that he shared of Providence was in reaction to one of our leaders passing data disaggregation legislation in Providence, Rhode Island. They are the fourth state to pass national art, to pass state-based education data disaggregation. Because as we saw in API's data, um, 20% of Vietnamese Americans have a bachelor's degree. 14% of the Laotian American community. So if we think of this room as representing the Southeast Asian American community, only three tables would stand up to represent individuals in our communities with a bachelor's degree. So 2018 matters because our communities have the power to elect congressional leaders to right the wrongs and to move our country back to a path of justice. Thank you very much. First, let me start by thanking all of you for being here. Just the fact that you're here spending time with all of us and with each other is such an important part. <laughs> Frankly, the fact that this is a nice cross-pollination, if I could use that word, of different segments of our, our population. We're not just talking about the national advocates, we're not talking about the community advocates, but we're also talking about sort of people that are involved on the political side, political side, the civic side. That's hugely important. With respect to sort of my organization, I represent Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AHAC. Our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. We do that through five independent affiliates. Actually, you met one of the deputy directors of one of our affiliates in Atlanta, Karuna, who was on the earlier panel. I'm not sure if she's still here somewhere. Uh, oh, there she is. <laughs> and also Andy Kang, who is the executive director of the Chicago affiliate, is also here. So please do get a chance to meet all of them. Um, and then we also have over 160 community partners throughout the country, 32 states, including the District of Columbia. Our pro program areas are in immigration, voting rights, hate crimes, census is of particular interest to us, as well as affirmative action, which obviously has been very hot right now. Uh, we can obviously go into more detail about that, and that's not really the point of this right now. You know, I think the other important point about this right now is just how we all work with each other and how I want, I hope that all of us can work together. And that's where the culture conveners certainly play a large role in organizing all of us. That's where NCAPA plays a large role in organizing all of us at the, the national side. Because frankly, as you guys know, we're still under-resourced. You know, my staff, we have a staff of about 20 people. We're considered one of the larger organizations here in D.C., Asian American organizations in D.C. Frankly, that's a shame. That's awful you know, that, that that is considered big by, by our standards. And that's why we need organizations to help pull us all together. And CAPA plays that vital role because then we're not duplicating resources. We're trying to coordinate our resources and play that, that those different roles that we can play. In terms of what's at stake for 2018, uh, it's interesting. I, I was I needed a little bit of caffeine, so I picked up a Coke. And um, what this says on this Coke is America. I think this is absolutely true. I think Quinn touched on it, but you know what's at stake is our values, is free speech, is democracy, is rule of law, and how that relates to all of us is. Frankly, I would venture a guess, I would put 
maybe not entire life savings, but most of my life savings, uh, the fact that almost all of us came here for those principles, or our parents came here for those principles. And that's what's at stake. I, mean, I, don't, I don't exaggerate, typically. And so I don't think this is an exaggeration. I, I was politically active for you know, the Clinton impeachment era, the first Iraq war with Bush one, the second Iraq war and, and you know, Bush Gore in 2000. This is nothing like all of that. I hate to say that because I don't think we should be in that position, mm -hmm. but it is much worse. And so we all need to pull together. And it's not about being Republican. It's not about being Democrat. It's about who we are as a country. What are our values? What are our core values? And trying to start to effect that change so that we can get back to those core values. The last thing I would say is just a little bit also about my personal history, about why I'm so passionate about this. Uh, and it goes back to those core values. That's certainly why my parents came here. That's why I was born in Taiwan. That's why we came here. Not only that, but when I was a, a child, my parents lost their work visa. And so I was actually an undocumented immigrant, a so-called illegal alien in today's parlance. Uh, and... You know, it was but for bipartisan legislation in 1986 that I had a path to citizenship. So I know the greatness of this country. This country is a great country, but we need to continually strive to work towards that. And that's what all of us working together has to strive to do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Taphorn, and I want to thank uh, API Vote, CLUSA, and the Culture Foundation for the opportunity to, to be in discussion with all of you today. I wasn't born Edward Taphorn. I was actually born Tian Chai Taphorn Bor Suthi. My parents and I immigrated from Thailand to the U.S. in the 1970s, where we landed in Houston, Texas. And the Texas of the 70s is perhaps not the Texas of today. We experienced a lot of discrimination and immigrant hatred. Uh, I've been called a number of names walking down grocery stores or in school. Things like gook, things like chink, things like fresh off the boat. But I've also been called names like faggot queer, damned to hell, abomination. And it's those experiences in my own personal journey of feeling ostracized, feeling marginalized, feeling otherwise, um, regardless of how you identify or who you are, that I think that every single person in this room can somehow resonate with. And so my hope is that as we think about the future of our country, and as we work to build power for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, that none of us in this room are saying anything or doing anything that tokenizes or marginalizes any member of the 50 different ethnic groups that fall within the Asian American Native Hawaiian diaspora, or that marginalizes or, or negatively impacts our colleagues and other racial ethnic minority communities. My parents and I changed our names legally when I was growing up due to the amount of discrimination we faced, so we Americanized our names. My father was originally a medical technologist, but because of the discrimination that he faced, found that he could no longer pursue a career in medical technology and found himself opening up a photo lab instead because of the discrimination, discriminatory actions of, of one of his former bosses. And it's those experiences of discrimination that I face, it's those discriminations of uh, having challenges accessing coverage and care. It's those experiences of dealing with the realities of what happens when someone or when you and your family become sick that drive my values, that drive my colleague and fellow team members' values around respect, fairness, equity, and health justice for all. And that's why at the Asian and Pacific Island American Health Forum, as we think about this coming midterm election, there is a lot at stake when it comes to the health and public health of all of our communities. The three things that I want to lift up in particular is, first of all, health care coverage. So the Affordable Care Act, before it was passed in 2010, 15% of our communities did not have access to affordable quality health care. We know through the hard work of many of the organizations inside and outside of this room, we were able to reduce that 15% to 9% 
And across all those open enrollment periods, it's only the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community that a recent Harvard Medical School study showed that that disparity was actually eliminated, the only racial ethnic minority community where that happened. But we also have known for over the past years that there have been attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And the makeup of Congress, uh, depending on how this election goes, could open up an opportunity in the future for further attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act to, to be pursued. I think a second piece when it comes to health care that is definitely on the battlefront is what the Supreme Court looks like. We know that this week there are confirmation hearings that will definitely make this particular Supreme Court Supreme Court more conservative than it has been in the past. And there's a very likely opportunity that within the next year, the next two years, the next four years or eight years, that additional seats could open up on the Supreme Court. And I think that it has fundamental implications for health care coverage, for immigration, for education, for housing, for a number of things that I know many of us in this room care about. Um, and in particular, I want to lift up the issue of reproductive justice for women and how uh, that is extremely threatened given the makeup of uh, the future, potential future makeup of the Supreme Court. And the third piece that I want to lift up in terms of what's at stake is when it comes to health funding and public health funding. We know that historically it has been very difficult for us to secure funding for our communities to work, not only on health care coverage, but on public health issues. For uh, programs like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health, REACH, which is one of the only federal public health programs that has a specific intention of reducing health disparities within racial ethnic minority communities. We also know that community navigator funding, funding for community health centers, all those aspects of health and public health funding are impacted by who sits not only in the halls of Congress, but also who sits within the White House. So those are the three things that I want to lift up when it comes to health care coverage and public health that are at stake at this election, recognizing that health and public health are so closely intertwined with many of the other issue areas that my fellow panelists have already uh, given voice to. All right, I'm going to ask a few questions of all the panelists. Um, this may come as a surprise, maybe even a shock to all of you, that when you bring together 34 national organizations with 34 executive directors and leaders in their own right, who are all burdened with having to run their own organizations, find funding, uh, be loud and proud and strong in their advocacy, and they're also opinionated, that sometimes we don't all agree, and that coalition work can be difficult. Now, I know if I pose a question like that and ask our panelists to talk about the challenges of working together in a coalition space, we go on for, for hours. And so we're going to try to keep it positive. And I'd like our panelists to speak specifically to how Encapas actually help uplift their voices in their individual organizations, and specifically to Suman, Kuhio, and Quinn in representing organizations that represent communities that are oftentimes not included in that narrative of what Asian American means, and sometimes we forget to say API, um, how NCAP provides that important platform for you for visibility in this larger conversation. So, Suman? Sure. Thanks, Greg. Um, well, I'll give one really concrete example. Um, there are 450,000 undocumented Indians alone in this country. 450,000. Um, it's probably higher now. Uh, we've known that number for at least four years. And when I first started using that number, Nancy Pelosi's eyebrows went like this. Oh. Right? <laughs> she didn't believe me. Um, but I think by virtue of the echo chamber that our friends at NCAPA, um, as well as our NCAPA colleagues can provide, um, we have drumbeat that number into that woman's brain until she now says it on the House floor. Um, and that provides a really powerful powerful example of how we can actually interrupt this narrative that all of our communities are doing well, we're all naturalized citizens, we're all opening up small businesses, and we're running for office. Um, and I think it provides a really powerful opportunity for us to remind not just ourselves, but also those who should be fighting for us in Washington, um, on the Hill and otherwise, uh, that we can't leave anybody in our community behind. Uh, 
let me just say, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier about NCAPA's role and some of our national partners. Uh, the meeting that Native Hawaiians had with President Obama to seek a pathway for federal recognition would not have been possible without that partnership that we have with them. Um, another thing is uh, being a part of this greater network. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's people from Chicago in here, but recently uh, a, com a company had tried to trademark, well they did trademark the word aloha and poke in the same, and so, so they sent cease and desist letters to Native Hawaiians back home saying we couldn't use the language. If they had it in the title of their shop, they said we couldn't use it. That's our own language and they're trying to tell us that we can't use it. So we issued a statement. In fact, we're pursuing legal right, uh, options to sue this company and NCAPA came to support us. We organized a rally and we marched through Chicago and within days we had hundreds of people that had joined hands uh, so being a part of a national network works. Um, in terms of our own, uh, I'm going to say challenges back home, having 160 members under your umbrella is is a lot of uh, collaboration. Um, but what we always focus on and how we always move forward is on finding common ground. Because no matter which organization you're with, there's always something that you have in common. So you water those things that you have in common and it grows from there. So we've been successful with that. Our membership is uh, growing. We just got 14 new members who the board still needs to approve, but we are growing as an organization. Um, but point in case is being a part of a national organization, being partners, uh, can really mean good advocacy uh, and policy advancement. Yeah, for CRAC, it's, I think it's a dual role that we play. One is to really see our responsibility in broadening the narrative of the Asian American movement and what it means to include Southeast Asian American issues and analysis into all the policy issues that we work on. And I think that has been shown through the fact that our immigration priorities have actually changed around enforcement, especially because of CRAC's role at the table and SALT's role at the table, um, wherein we are really fighting back against um, against this administration's attacks of uh, undocumented individuals and Southeast Asian American refugees with past criminal conviction records. This is not a stance that NCAPA probably would have taken 25 years ago. And so I take it as a very serious responsibility to pay forward as well what has been provided to CRAC in having an Asian American community that we are a part of, but that is also beyond us. And oftentimes, I was thinking about this question last, actually this morning, NCAPA reminds me of a national Avengers. So I don't know, my husband is a total comic geek, um, and I'm like watching all these movies. But honestly, with one call, I can get to the lead expert on South Asian hate crimes. I can get to the expert on Asian American organizing. I can get to the expert on Asian American census. I can get to the expert on health disparities and health equity with Health Forum and with App Show. And we have so many other members in the room. And that is an incredibly powerful network. And on my first on my first month of being executive director, Simone and I were in a meeting with the Department of Homeland Security deputy director. We nudged each other, and we have become incredible partners that continue to fight for our community's rights together. And that would not have been possible had it not been for Encapa. I call Black Panther. <laughs> well, if you. Talk to Quinn about affirmative action, you might see her turn into the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, to Ed and Alvina, is there anything you'd like to add as far as the importance of the platform for your organizations and how it's worked and helped? Sure. So, so I'll take your Avengers metaphor and add the Voltron metaphor. So uh, if, for those of you who are familiar with Voltron, it's an Asian anime 
uh, cartoon where there's five separate robot lion fighters that are each extremely powerful, but when they come together, they form this amazing force. And that's also how I think about Encapa. Uh, for the health form, we have had the privilege of serving as one of the chairs for the health committee of Encapa for a number of years, along with uh, a number of fellow health committee members who are in the room, folks like Acho and CRAC and NAPOF and NAPAFASA, JCL, Appeal, a number of organizations. And what's been great about the health committee, and I think this is true for probably all of NCAPA's committees, is it provides an important opportunity for those of us who are working at the national level to stay connected with one another, to be a resource and asset for one another, and also to collectively think about how we can strategize together. So on the health committee in particular, we've had the opportunity to coalesce around a policy platform that has included a number of issues that are important to our NCAPA member organizations. Things that include uh, preserving and expanding the Affordable Care Act, removing restrictions to health care coverage based on immigration status, ensuring coverage for behavioral health and mental health services, eliminating health disparities, promoting reproductive justice, ending gender-based violence, and preventing gun violence. Uh, these are just the, the wealth of different issues that I think we're much stronger together working on than we would have been working individually. Uh, and I think what has also been important is that our work uh, straddles not just the inside the beltway work, but has been conscious about how we lift up the power and voice, the data and stories of our local and regional partners across each of our national organizations. And I know that in the health forum, one of the things that we talk about is the importance of both service and advocacy and civic engagement. It's not enough for us as organizations to provide valuable services to our communities if we are not also lifting up their engagement as communities to exercise their power, their voice, and in influencing how decisions are made, whether that's at the state level, at the local level, or at the national level. And that's one of the reasons why, over the past couple of years in particular, we've wanted to also support our community-based organizations in doing civic engagement work. And one of the ways that we've done that is through cross-state phone banking that's been funded by the Culture Foundation, where we've had the opportunity to connect with folks, on our fellow in Kevin members who are doing civic engagement connect with uh, the our fellow state conveners uh, within the culture structure to help provide in-language phone banking. And for some of the volunteers who engaged in this phone banking, what they heard from the folks that they reached out to was that for many of them, this was the first time that anyone had ever contacted them to get engaged and involved in the election cycle. <laughs> I'll just echo that. I think the biggest, the one word that comes to mind for me is the amplification and the work that we're able to do that's amplified through our entire network. You know, John mentioned that all of our organizations are relatively small. Apollo only has a small but mighty team of four. And so that means that we don't always have all the capacity and staff to track every single policy issue or have subject matter experts on immigration or whatnot. But we know that at any given moment, we can go to any of our colleagues and be able to get that expertise, get that guidance, you know, and from Greg to be able to get that guidance on how we should think about our policy strategy or our Hill strategy. That's absolutely a value add and, and critical for us. And, and then the ability to just work together as a family on joint programs like um, Southeast Asian Equal Pay Day coming up with NAPOF and with CRAG. And, uh, you know, all of our organizations all came together and wrote a letter to Senate um, in preparation for the Supreme Court hearings this week and had questions that we wanted to pose to Brett Kavanaugh from each of our different perspectives. And so I think the value of NCAPA is it allows us to express um, our policy agenda intersectionally, not just through our individual identities and ethnicities, but also through all the range of issues that value and matter to us. I just want to add another piece, too. I think that, um, so anybody who does organizing work, either on the Hill or on the ground, will tell you um, that you have got to be consistent and you have to be persistent, right? And we all know that we represent a huge community, but we're also dealing with a multiplicity of threats and issues all at the same time. And so I think being able to rely on our colleagues in NCAPA to be able to be persistent and insistent uh, on the Hill 
hill across issues or across communities is critical, right? Um, being able to be like a steady drumbeat that does not go anywhere when it comes to preserving family-based immigration, but also being really clear um, that something like anti-Muslim hate crimes uh, affect all of our communities at the same time that we're incredibly vigilant about the implications of a census question or a census process that asks us about our citizenship. And then the final piece that I'll just say is that um, and CAPA also provides us with an opportunity to create a two-way relationship on what's happening on the ground. I think perhaps there's some folks here from Apano out in Oregon who um, were at the really on the, at the ground zero of looking at a wave of detentions increasingly um, that we're seeing uh, with respect to South Asian communities that we know reflect the reality of family separation for Central American and Latin American communities. And so being able to draw a direct line between family separation, whether it's in Folkestone, Georgia, whether it's in Sheridan, whether it's in Victorville, California, and connecting the dots between how immigration enforcement and detention and the evisceration of refugee and asylum protections increasingly affect not just Latinos, but Asian Americans and AAPIs incredibly, um, increasingly and incredibly provides a really strong message, again, that AAPIs have skin in the game um, and have ground game to build when it comes to our very core soul as a nation of immigrants. And the CAPA has been critical to be able to provide that amplification as well as that persistent messaging. I know we're at time, we're making a little bit of trouble, but there is one question that I think is important to answer, and I'm going to turn it to John, and obviously we have to be laser focused on 2018, the now, but there's obviously much more at stake beyond that, so John, if you could touch a little bit to close us out on what's at stake beyond 2018. Uh, sure, and, and well, there's a lot at stake beyond 2018. I think the one thing that I know almost all the groups here are working on is the census. And that is critical because that is a cornerstone to making sure that literally, literally, our community is counted. Uh, as you know, there is currently a citizenship question on the 2020 census that uh, my organization, along with MALDEF, is fortunate enough to, we're, we're litigating that issue. I don't know how that litigation is going to go. Uh, I think another path, obviously, is to get Congress to change it, and that's where all of us come in, is that we do need to have members of Congress. Again, I'm not going to limit it to just Democrats. Uh, obviously, sort of, if you look at the, the, the voting records, that's probably true, but you know, we need enough support to change that question. So certainly that is something that everyone should be focused on. I think the last thing I, I would want to say, if I could sort of wrap up what I've been thinking about it is, as I listen to everybody talking, is just also sort of think about the different roles that all of us play, right? Uh, on some of these issues, whether it's census with data disaggregation, whether it's affirmative action, there are members of our community that we that don't agree with us. And we, our organization, is in support of affirmative action. There is a large segment of the Asian American population. I'm Chinese American. I'm gonna sort of speak for my own community. There's a large amount, large segment of the Chinese American community that does not support affirmative action. Uh, there are some members of the Chinese American community, as uh, Karthik pointed out, that is not in support of data disaggregation. We need to communicate. We need to keep these lines of communication open. Uh, and that's where sort of all these organizations, again, have different roles to play. CRAC needs to provide that affirmative case for why that data is so necessary for the Southeast Asian population. The health form could provide that in the context of what the health issues are and why there are disparities between different class, different ethnicities. But then for me, being a Chinese American who also speaks Mandarin, part of my role I recognize is to talk to my community, talk to that community of first generation immigrants and explain to them why this is important, why this is not trying to target them in any way, and just try to get everyone to understand. So that's the last message I would leave everyone with this. Think about what special role you can play in this process, whether it's in 2018 or whether it's beyond. Thanks, John. We've covered a lot of topics, and I'm sure there are a number of questions, and our panelists will stick around, I believe, for the most part, and we'll be happy to answer them, but is there one burning question that someone just feels like they have to get off their chest? I'm sure it'll come to you. If not, then I will wrap this up, 
And I will say thank you for your attention. And I want to take a moment to recognize the other Kappa members that are in the room. Uh, Apsho is here, and Kappa is here. Uh, OCA, I saw OCA somewhere. Jason with NAFA is here as well. Uh, Napoff is also in the house. Um, Capacity, are you yeah. guys still here? Anj. Yep. Hey, Anj. <laughs> Anyways, this is all to say that Oh, David, my office mate. I can't forget him. Um, <laughs> this is all to say that in Kappa, with our 30 plus members, we cover a lot of ground. And it's this crazy experiment and this belief that we as an API community can actually come together and get some things done and possibly get more done when we work together. And when I started, I said, you know, civic engagement is and voting is that great equalizer. And it truly is. But if we're electing elected officials who don't understand our issues and don't understand our communities, winning elections matters much less. And so winning elections is important, but the policy work is also important. And making sure that we're doing those two things in concert is really our next big challenge for our community. So thank you for your attention. Thank you to the Coulter Foundation as well as CLUSA for their sponsorship. We haven't officially had a chance to work together, but on a personal note, I greatly appreciate you supporting our members of NCAPA because NCAPA can only be great when our members are. So thank you all very much.